since they are um, wonderful and provocative and exactly on point. So let me just go down. Um, you had three questions um, before. Uh, and uh, uh, for those of you who haven't had the experience, there's nothing sweeter than being criticized by your former student. It's the best. It is the best. So the first question that you had was um, um, something like, uh, what about um, within the public sphere when you said should speech be uh, repressed? And you talked about it in the context of truth. So um, I myself take a view about the public sphere that it's not a, a sphere of truth, it's a sphere of opinion. Politics is all about the clash of opinions. And, um, and I get this, I, you know, I'm unabashedly, I get this from Hannah Arendt. She has a very a wonderful essay called Truth in Politics. If you know the truth, then it can no longer be political. She says, you know, once you've been out of the cave, and you go back in, you cannot be in the cave. But politics is a world in which we're all in the cave because we're politically equal. There's a, there's a saying in the First, uh, First Amendment doctrine that there's an equality of status in the field of ideas. All ideas are equal. Now, if you imagine that from an epistemological point of view, it's nonsense. It means there can't be truth. But um, really what it, that idea, what it refers to is political equality. We are equally, we, e we have the equal political right to participate in the formation of public opinion. And that's what that equ uh, equality is supposed to be. That means that we're dealing in the realm of opinion and persuading each other. That's what you, there's no persuasion when it comes to truth. It's either true or not true. And uh, if you see the truth, you're like Socrates. You know, you can't be governed by the opinion of the state anymore because you know what's true. So truth and politics, they're a very uneasy pair. Um, actually, ontologically speaking. Um, you said before, you, the next question you had was, how do we tell the spheres apart? And the answer is, um, this is performative. Um, as, we, um, as we think about the connections between these spheres, as a court, like from the perspective of a court, you're forced to decide what the boundaries are. So a simple example of it would be this. If you're in the military, you're in a managerial situation where your speech is regulated by the needs of the military. Um, you can't say certain things. If you're in public discourse, um, the idea would be, as you said, content neutrality, the state's gonna allow you to say what you want. So suppose you're a draftee, and you're in the military, and you're in your bunk, and you're writing the prime minister, but my commanding general is a jerk. Are they in the military, or are they in public discourse? And of course, the answer is you're always in both. In the real world, there aren't these spheres. But we treat you as in one sphere or another. And as the court decides, either that was mutiny, that was violating the, the regulations of how you speak about your commanding officer, or you were a constituent talking to uh, your elected <coughs> official. As they conceptualize it one way or another, they will be constituting and creating the separation of spheres. So this is done. Um, by courts or by whoever is trying to evaluate what the appropriate framework is for understanding a particular speech. Act. And much of what's interesting in freedom of speech law is about the creation of these boundaries. There are endless examples of these boundaries, but that's much, and you were talking before about democratic constitutionalism. That's an example of setting boundaries between on the one hand the expertise of the court, and on the other hand the formation of that political legitimacy on which all law is founded. And how those two spheres integrate really interesting theoretically. Um, and your third question was, um, how do we talk to each other when we don't have anything in common? And the answer is, if you really can't talk to each other, you're in a civil war. And other than that, it's our obligation to find what we do have in common. So um, Ofra studied with Reba Siegel, who's my wife, and you know she is one of the great advocates for reproductive rights in the United States. But she made common cause with those who were pro-life in order to, to get enacted protections for pregnant workers. She found something in common and she wrote a statement together with two pro-life people that helped to get the law enacted in this Congress. Finding a way, finding what you do have in common, that's the art of the political. And when those arts fail, when the political fails, um, then we're really in straits. But you know, us being human, us being part of many, many different communities that overlap, we tend to find and can't find things in common. And it's a last resort. It's a last resort to say friend enemy, to say what Schmidt says, because then we really have no political recourse vis-a-vis -vis each other at all. And that's often, it's often hard to find something in common. 
with those people. I, when Trump was elected in the United States, I was the dean. And of course, the whole law school started crying and weeping in the halls. And half because my students no longer had they jobs. They were, I mean, it was just terrible. So we had a, a, a the dean you call a meeting of the whole school. We had a panel of people. And most of the people on the panel, my faculty colleagues, said, don't let go of your anger. Don't normalize this. Stay <coughs> angry at this. This is a bad, terrible, horrible thing. And my message was, um, actually, you just lost an election. <laughs> you better talk to the people who voted against you to find out why they voted against you and to understand what needs are being expressed here. And your anger in that process is not your friend. And that was not a message well received, let me just tell you. But I think it's the ultimate it's the political message, unless you can reconstitute in the face of something as provocative as the election of Trump, you're giving up hope on the political. You can't win it by force. You just can't do it. And that goes to your first question about, I, mean, I love the passage from Leviticus, which I didn't know about, because I'm unfortunately an ignoramus about such things. But, but the idea of hatred is really a very interesting concept in the context of a liberal democracy. Because to say that you have hate is ultimately to exile and excommunicate. This is why one has to be very careful with the idea of hate speech and, and hatred generally, because when you put that label on someone, they are outside of the liberal state that you were um, talking about. And, uh, you know, one believes in Freud and one believes in the revenge of the repressed. One has to be very careful about the repression that one is instigating because what's going to come back. So, you know, we're very easy with that in one form of liberalism and another form of liberalism. This is the ultimate excommunication. And one has to be extremely careful how one uses that that form of excommunication. Um, you, you said that freedom of speech was not absolute and that it's always balanced. Well, another way of saying always balanced is balanced by what? And that's the point about Occam's razor in this thing. If you actually look at it, it's always balanced. And it's and the good of it is always the good of the relate of the concrete situation. So we're not talking about the abstract good of freedom of speech when we actually do the balancing. That's what, you know, that's the insight I came to writing this simple little piece for, you know, a non someone who hasn't been like I have been socialized into the idea that there's a liberal free speech principle. But when you actually stand back and say, what are we balancing against what? We're always balancing something concrete against something concrete. And that's telling you about the free speech principle itself as distinct from the good of a social practice. So if you're thinking about the unit of analysis as the social practice, you're thinking, this is my intellectual roots. You're thinking along the lines of someone like Wittgenstein or Peter Winch or Alistair McIntyre says social life consists of mutual understandings, which are constitute practices. And abstraction of freedom of speech is actually violent with regard to those practices. And um, it takes a great deal of training to be able to exercise that intellectual violence and to, and to miss the fact that I'm always balancing the practice. Right? So this is just returning to kind of a simple-minded, you know, the emperor has no clothes kind of um, observation. Larry Alexander. Is, uh, yeah, exactly. Cut the Gordian knot. <coughs> so um, when um, the, the next point you made was about, I'm trying to read my handwriting, which is just dreadful. Um, the, the next point you made was about um, uh, about liberalism, and um, uh, the nature uh, of this the was a symptom of the fact that we have now people who are anti-liberal. And uh, it's true that the more consensus you have starting out, the easier it is to have a democratic state. And the more the divisions are, and the deeper, the harder it is. And particularly, that's going to be true in matters of liberalism. But it's also going to be true that people have an idea of flourishing in life and things like that. And it's also true that your insight, I think, leads you to understand why, for example, people like Amy Gutman stress the importance of democratic education. <coughs> people have to be socialized into whatever values we have in common, or the military here. You know, you might say the original sin in Israel was exclusion from the military in certain ways, because that means you have less and less in common. The less you have in common, and I wouldn't put it in terms of liberalism, non-liberalism. I would just say in common period, in whatever the axis that might be. But that means that there are certain things, perhaps, you don't want to give up on that make you have things in common. Because in the end, if you're left with nothing in common, then you're really left without the possibility of state. And so you know, one, one is faced with a pretty hard choice there. Uh, and it's also you know, where you put your, your, your analytic priorities in terms of what you're going to compromise on 
in which you're not going to compromise. Um, so I, in my work, I theorize the question of when it is that the speech is off limits. When you talk about content discrimination, I talk about the paradox of public discourse. That's the label I put on this. And um, it, uh, it, the paradox takes the following form. We protect speech in order to facilitate the health of public discourse. But certain speech, which violates civility norms, norms of respect, um, undermines the ability of public discourse to do its work. So if I use the law to exclude people who are uncivil from public discourse, I automatically exclude <coughs> them from the possibility of democratic legitimation. I exclude them from the sphere in which they can take ownership of the state. But if I permit it, um, then um, they are included within it, but at the same time they're undermining the success of public discourse. That's a paradox, meaning there is no unique solution to it. One, one is faced with a question of what I would call statesmanship. You know, a statesman is faced with a situation where there's no mechanical solution, there's no algorithmic, you can't use a mathematical equation to get the answer. You make your best judgment about what will serve the long-term interests at stake, and then you, you gamble on it. And you either succeed or you don't succeed. I, I don't think there's any way around that. You know? They're ultimately, to my mind, questions of freedom of speech are not questions of rules like content neutrality, but questions of statesmanship of this kind. How one solves this paradox. Because either way, you lose. And which way do you lose less? And which way do you ultimately lose? That's uh, Alex the Quill. It's what? The, the Quill, uh, the, the writing oh. of uh, Alex the Quill about the, the nature of American justices. Yes. This is the same spirit. Exactly right? like that. <coughs> I have a piece called Theorizing Disagreement in which I argue that the law always has to take account of the political legitimation of the law as a judge. As a judge, one needs to account for the legitimacy of the institution of the law qua law. Um, and that means going outside the internal perspective of the law when it's at stake. And I think and that goes to the interpenetration of the spheres. That we started with. So uh, that, that's what I'm saying. Thank you so much. There is so much on the